Hello, everyone, and happy Mother's Day. Thanks so much for joining us for this Sunday's edition of Alaska Weather. I'm Dave Percy, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service, and again, I'll be hosting today's show. <clears throat> On the breakup map here, not a lot of changes from yesterday. Still a uh, flood advisory on the Susitna River. Uh, an ice jam has uh, caused minor flooding in the Curry area, which is covering the railroad tracks. Uh, that's been since Friday, and that was due to remain out through 11 a.m. on Monday. And that area of uh, minor flooding, that's well west of the, or well away, I'm not sure if it's east or west. Anyway, it's well away from the Parks Highway. Otherwise, uh, not a lot of changes, although the uh, Yukon River now has uh, some open, the some open area here is, looks like it's progressed down to now Galena, but still uh, mostly ice on down and uh, opening up a little bit back up here toward the uh, north there on the, into the Koyukuk Valley areas from what it has been with some open area there. But the uh, Noatak River, for example, and the Colville, of course, they're still iced up. <clears throat> Moving on to satellite imagery, a lot of clouds here rolling into the yukon Cuscombe Delta today, also up across the uh, Seward Peninsula, St. Lawrence Island, and then clouds break up here over the eastern interior where the uh, precipitation is a little more showery and pretty isolated with uh, more sunshine down over northern Bristol Bay. Up over the central north slope looking pretty good, but clouds across mid and high level clouds mostly here along the uh, Arctic coast. And uh, out to the west, kind of uh, some banding to the clouds here. Not a real strong frontal system, but uh, low pressure moving east to the south of the Aleutians. That's nudged some moisture and a little bit of rain here, and not much in the way of wind, nothing significant, especially uh, for the Aleutians, as far as they're concerned, no significant wind out there, and just some light rain associated with that, trying to push in toward Adak and Atka. Otherwise, uh, fair here over the southern Bering Sea, just uh, variable clouds. Some showers with this cloud batch has rolled into the Pervilof Islands this afternoon. They got a uh, report of rain at St. Paul, and uh, otherwise, uh, Central interior, not too bad here with uh, broken clouds uh, indicating somewhat showery convective nature to the uh, precipitation there. <clears throat> Although it is getting into that time of the year, it'd be just a matter of time until we start seeing thunderstorms popping up there through interior Alaska. But in the meantime, we have this low tracking northward toward the North Gulf Coast. You can see the front almost up to about Yakutat, where they picked up uh, one and a third inches of rain in the last... Uh, well, today, during the day today, they picked up a third, one and a third inches of rain. That's where the heaviest precipitation was going. Also, the northern panhandle, uh, Haines had about a third of an inch, as did uh, Elfin Cove. Cordova, only a tenth of an inch. And uh, no rain yet over at Portage or Seward. And a little bit of rain up in the Valdez area. But and that's uh, roughly about it as far as the precipitation goes. It's low weakening now as it heads north. It's already maxed out at its lowest pressure earlier, earlier today. And uh, on the chart, it's uh, back up to about 999 millibars from the low of around 995 millibars uh, overnight last night, earlier this morning. Another weaker low developing up here over the eastern interior, just north of the Alaska Range and clouds coming northward there, well across the 40-mile country upper Tanana Valley, but back into the mid Tanana Valley, looks like some sunshine. And then you pick up the uh, showery conditions here to the, as you move farther west, general area of rain over the Yukon and part northern Kuskokwim Delta, Yukon Delta up to the Seward Peninsula, and that fell as snow when it, uh, earlier today at Savunga and Gamble, uh, just fog, two miles visibility and fog this afternoon and isolated showers along the northwest coast, and really isolated showers over the northeast Brooks Range area here with uh, the Arctic Coast dry today with variable clouds, mostly of the high variety, some patchy areas of lower clouds as well, and uh, isolated showers possible over Kodiak Island, uh, Alaska Peninsula, possibly to the eastern Aleutians, but uh, winds light all through this area. Bering Sea, high pressure at the surface here, light winds, even uh, winds not significant with this low at all, and possible small craft advisory winds here, uh, probably uh, with that front uh, of the 25 to 30 knot range with some periods of light rain. 
And for tonight, that uh, slips on off to the southeast, and uh, winds will diminish a little bit there, but you have the high to the north, still enough of a gradient to possibly keep small craft advisories for the western Aleutians. Uh, real light winds here for the eastern Aleutians with uh, mostly cloudy skies, isolated showers, chance of rain, Amchitka to roughly Adak, uh, may escape it there at Atka, or you could get a few sprinkles. Otherwise, the Arctic coast north slope uh, to the Brooks Range looking for scattered rain and snow showers uh, up in that area, dry south of the mountains, isolated showers from the Selawig Valley across the Seward Peninsula on up toward Kivalina and Point Hope, while the central interior <coughs> Seeing an increase in the clouds, if an increase in the rain with this low now taking over, the other one uh, moves up. They kind of merge, trough, keeping its showers going along the North Gulf Coast. And uh, what's left of that uh, front, or actually the front moves inland, weakens into a trough, and another trough swings in and keeps it wet uh, throughout the night tonight over the northern southeast coast. Just isolated showers down toward the south. Uh, may see an increase in the clouds there with that rolling through as that trough swings through. Uh, but may go precipitation free for places like Klawak, Heidelberg, and uh, Ketchikan. Otherwise, rain on the increase here, mid Tanana Valley, eastward to the border, possibly as far north as Eagle, back down to the Alaska Range Copper River Basin, pretty good chance of some moisture tonight. And then for tomorrow, we'll see uh, that low keeps it wet over the interior, especially from the Alaska Range northward. Across uh, the upper Tanana and mid Tanana Valley areas, showers back toward Tanana and also extending west-northwest along that trough. Dry north of there, Koyukuk Valley looking good. Uh, Yukon, uh, northern areas, Brooks Range, part of the North Slope, isolated fog flurries, eastern Arctic coast, and that's about it. High pressure dominating now the western Bering Sea, really light winds out here. So look for some areas of low clouds and areas of fog as well. Isolated showers, Alaska Peninsula, eastern Aleutians. Couple of weak troughs here, pick up the shower activity. Again, keeping it uh, mostly cloudy and unsettled from Bristol Bay back up to, well, St. Lawrence Island and to a lesser extent there over the Northwest. And then for Tuesday, a uh, weak low up here, just 1,015 millibars. Uh, light winds, kind of an east-northeast breeze there through the Brooks Range, but really light winds from the western interior all the way out, high pressure covering the western Bering Sea. Weak disturbance coming over the top, bring a chance of showers into the Pribilof Islands with uh, cloudy skies, but look for some breaks, sun breaks, Alaska Peninsula, and all of the Aleutian chain into Bristol Bay. Showers uh, could be moderate possibly here through the uh, west central interior associated with this low and then scattering out as you head east there, mostly right along that trough axis. So drier day coming up Tuesday for the uh, eastern interior there, mid and upper Tanana Valley. Isolated showers, Copper River Basin, uh, more widespread shower threat for the North Gulf Coast to the Kenai Peninsula, possibly Cook Inlet. Back to the uh, mostly sunny conditions, partly to mostly sunny. Most of the clouds will probably be up over the uh, northern southeast coast, but high pressure right off the coast. That may keep uh, some more clouds in, especially during the overnight and early morning hours, right in along the coastline there. But uh, staying dry with light winds uh, looks to be about it. And then this uh, trough swinging northwestward brings a threat of some rain into the Kodiak Island area on the east side of the island late in the afternoon, but that may hold off, probably hold off until Tuesday evening. And for temperatures, lows tonight, uh, anywhere from the upper teens, the eastern Arctic coast to upper 20s on the west side, lower to mid 30s here in the northwest, central interior, upper 30s to near 40, and uh, 30s south of the Brooks Range to near 40, all the way down to Kodiak Island. 30s, high 30s, Aleutians, mid 30s, Pribilofs, mid to upper 30s, Alaska Peninsula, Bristol Bay. 40s for the Panhandle. Highs tomorrow, upper 40s north to mid 50s south of the southeast coast. So look for some cooling down there with that trough swinging through. Lower 50s here for the uh, uh, Copper River Basin. And cooler, meaning like uh, Shelter Cove was 76 today and 70 degrees at Metlakatla. So definitely a cool down going on up there. 55 to 62, say, for the central interior. And high staying in the uh, upper 20s there for much of the Arctic coast. But Point Lay on down 30s, lower 40, 42 at Kotzebue. And uh, mid 50s there into the Kobuk Valley. <clears throat> with 40s out to the west, cooling into 30s over the Bering Sea. Lower 40s for the Aleutians. Lows the following morning back down into the uh, teens. Eastern Central Arctic Coast, North Slope areas, 20s and then 30s south of the mountains, 
all the way down to the North Gulf Coast, mid to upper 30s and lower 40s for the Panhandle. Highs the following afternoon, still in the upper 50s, near 60 down south, cooler to the north, upper 50s, uh, maybe lower 60s in some areas there for the eastern and central interior. 50s, southern Alaska, 40s, western interior with uh, 30s out over the Bering Sea and 20s up along the Arctic coast. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Moving into the fly and weather graphic, IFR out here, western Seward Peninsula, but not quite reaching St. Lawrence Island. And some more down here over the uh, southwest mountains there, uh, just east of Cuscoquam Bay, marginal VFR from the Alaska Peninsula, eastern Aleutians, all the way up to St. Lawrence Island, including the Pribilofs and some IFR uh, slipping on into the central Aleutians from the west and southwest. Areas of IFR starting the day out here over the northern panhandle and the uh, coast mountains there as well as the Talkeetan is up to the Alaska range with marginal VFR uh, developing here over the uh, 40 mile country upper Tanana Valley which expands tomorrow afternoon with the uh, moisture moving in and the clouds and precipitation. Some IFR lingering here along the Alaska range but marginal VFR uh, more expansive there through the Tanana Valley and Central Interior, but staying VFR, Koyukuk, Kobuk Valley, Upper Yukon, marginal for the North Slope, and marginal VFR now, Northern Panhandle, VFR to the South, and uh, just a patch of IFR now near Nunavak Island. And for uh, Tuesday morning, some IFR here in over the uh, Southwest, Yukon, Cuscombe Delta, otherwise marginal. VFR extending just about all the way out, but not quite to the western Aleutians. Marginal VFR from the Brooks Range on out to the Arctic coast. And some IFR here along the Alaska Range, Talkeetan, or I'm sorry, the uh, White Mountains and the North Gulf Coast. And then back into the northern Panhandle, we're seeing VFR to the south. And for the afternoon, good VFR in the forecast now for the southeast coast there from Dixon Entrance on up. Marginal VFR, though, for the North Gulf Coast, VFR Copper River Basin, marginal conditions in across South Central Alaska, Kenai Peninsula, Southern Cusquam Valley, and then more widespread here all along the West Coast, and also the North Slope areas with uh, some IFR right there, right over the Perbloff Islands. Otherwise, marginal VFR, St. Lawrence Island, down to the Fox Islands, eastward to the Central Aleutians, becoming a uh, VFR there west of Amchitka Island. And for the passes, Anatovic and Adigan, both VFR the entire day tomorrow. And for the uh, Lake Clark and Merrill passes, looks like it'll be occasionally marginal uh, throughout Monday and same forecast for rainy, probably a little more marginal VFR there than Lake Clark and Merrill. And for Windy, it looks pretty marginal, as does Isabel, looks IFR for tomorrow and Mintasta marginal with uh, Tanita. Occasionally we'll see some marginal VFR, possibly for that pass, both west and east entrance. Portage marginal VFR becoming VFR. And for Chilkoot and White, IFR becoming marginal VFR, slow, or probably in the later part of the morning. And for the freezing levels here, we've got cool air aloft, central eastern Bering Sea, 2,000 feet, well south of the Alaska Peninsula, becoming a little milder out here to the west, up to 6,000. And uh, 4,000 feet, central interior, cold pocket here over the uh, eastern Copper River Basin, northern Panhandle, but that uh, warms up to about uh, 8,000 feet there by the time you get to the Queen Charlotte's Cross Dixon entrance. Icing threats, mostly uh, eastern interior now, areas of uh, light to uh, isolated moderate rime icing here over the eastern interior, back to the west into the Cuscombe Valley, southward across Copper River Basin, in across the northern southeast coast. And for the jet stream, ridging here, uh, trying to poke up, it, well, uh, protecting the southern panhandle, but that 100 knot jet uh, carrying some moisture into the north. Upper level low there with the clouds and rain, cool conditions for tomorrow over the eastern uh, interior areas, and also one along the southwest coast. And taking a look at uh, 9,000 feet, we've got a good southwest, west-southwest flow here, 25 to 35 knots strongest there over the northern panhandle there, Link Canal Glacier Bay area. Uh, fourth of the day tomorrow, but lighter around this low center, just uh, 15 to 20 or 10 to 20. Really light winds here from south-central Alaska, northward, north slope, uh, just about no wind at all at this elevation. And around this trough, not much wind with it either. Maybe 20 to 25 knots coming around the back side of that, 15 to 20 out in advance of it. 
and out to the west, uh, 15 to 25 knot winds of a uh, mostly looks like northeast direction out there. 3,000 feet, uh, even lighter at this elevation with ridging out to the west. And we've got 20 to 25 knots or 15 to 25 into the panhandle out of the west-southwest. Light winds over the interior except maybe 20 to 25. Turbulence, isolated moderate chop uh, there northern southeast coast. And over the eastern interior, that's about it. Uh, so after the break, I'll be back with a look at the marine forecast and other interesting information. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, joined again by Eric Stevens uh, from the GINA, or Geographic Information Network of Alaska at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Thanks for joining us again, Eric. Glad to be here. Thanks. Uh, we are talking about satellites today and uh, what, what are satellites? And the easy way to talk about that would be to uh, introduce our friend the globe here, which is a round uh, spheroid type shape. We haven't been on a flat earth uh, as far as uh, history is known for uh, several hundred years now. And because of that, we, we also know that we are orbiting around other objects in space and that objects are orbiting mm -hmm. around the earth as well. We call all those things satellites in some form or fashion, right Eric? Right, well this leads to the discussion of Johannes Kepler's oh, yeah. research 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, did some of the early work and founded the three laws of planetary motion, which okay. are important to planets mm -hmm. and also to weather satellites. Okay. Kepler's first law talks about how uh, the orbit of an object around another object is mm -hmm. uh, an ellipse, not necessarily a circle. Kind of a flattened circle? Yeah, okay. depending on how I mean, flat it could be. Okay. Uh, for our purposes, we'll just say they're mostly circular. Okay. The second law is most important for us, though, yeah. and that is the closer an object is to the thing it's orbiting, mm -hmm. the faster it goes. So in the solar system, the planet Mercury is mm -hmm. the closest planet to the sun. It orbits the sun in 88 days. It moves at 100,000 kilometers an hour. It's it a lot is different just than Earth. moving. Okay. Right. And um, further out from the Earth is Jupiter, mm -hmm. and it moves at only one quarter the speed of Mercury, and it has to uh, go further. So it takes 12 of our years for Jupiter to make one lap. Hmm. Okay. The further out you are, the slower you go. Okay. So we're talking about planets. Why? What does it have to do with weather satellites? Turns out, Kepler's laws apply to planets orbiting the sun. They also apply to satellites orbiting the Earth. Okay. You know, our natural satellite is the moon. There's right. the famous Apollo 8 Earthrise shot. Beautiful shot. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You could just talk about that forever. <laughs> uh, December 1968, uh -huh. the moon is about a quarter of a million miles away from the Earth. Okay. It takes a month to go around mm -hmm. the Earth. It's that far out, it takes a full month to do an orbit. Another shot here of the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. Instead of being 250,000 miles out, the ISS is only 250 miles out. It's really close. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't take a full month for the space station to go around the Earth. It only takes right. 90 minutes. Oh. It's so close, it just whips right around 90 minutes. Okay. So weather satellites, there are a number of weather satellites and there are a number of orbits. The further out you have the satellite, the mm -hmm. longer it takes to go around the Earth. And this is important because different satellites have different purposes. So we have a satellite here. This little okay. salt shaker lid will serve as our satellite going around the Earth. Let's say you have a satellite that's 22,000 miles above the Earth. Uh -huh. This is kind of a magical spot because at that distance, it takes a full day for the satellite to go around the Earth. Oh, Imagine okay. if you put your satellite 22,000 miles up from the equator uh -huh. and had it go with the Earth as the Earth spun. At the same speed. Right. Okay. The satellite goes around the Earth just as fast as the Earth itself is turning in effect. The satellite will hover in one spot, oh, I see. and it, it appears when you make a movie loop of picture after mm -hmm. picture after picture, you can replay that and you get these movie loops. Geostationary satellites, these okay. are called, because uh -huh. they're stationary in appearance, and uh, they provide a constant frame of reference. We've got an example here, another nice thing about these satellites, since they're that far out mm -hmm. at 22,000 miles, you can see from pole to pole, which is nice. So they're, they're pretty broad view and a constant frame of reference. So th those are the pictures, that if you're watching a weather satellite loop on TV, your favorite weather mm -hmm. show, that's the picture that you're going to see is one you that's bet. sitting over the same spot. If you're seeing a, a movie loop play uh -huh. again and again, that came from geostationary satellites. Okay. That's the only way you can do that. Yeah. The bummer, though, for us in Alaska is yeah. we're up on the very top of the planet, and mm -hmm. for, for geostationary satellites to work, they have to be over the equator. So for the geostationary bird to view Alaska, it's kind of like reading a book, but you're reading it edge on oh, like that. Right. So there's another kind of orbit called the polar orbit, okay. which is nice. We're near the pole. Yeah. And here's a satellite. Those polar orbiters are much closer to the Earth. Mm -hmm. 
getting down toward International Space Station elevation, and they're not in the equatorial plane, rather their orbital plane is inclined okay. like this, and the Earth turns under that satellite as the satellite orbits. Hmm. The nice thing about that is for Alaska, the satellite will go right over Alaska a few times a day, and so you get a much closer image. We've got a, a shot from the uh, Sumi NPP satellite, uh -huh. Uh, specifically, it's a true color image from the VIRS sensor. That's an acronym there. Okay. But it's a beautiful shot of Alaska, and you can see so much detail. The kind of detail because you're close in. Very high resolution. You couldn't yeah. get this kind of view from geostationary satellites. Okay. The, the advantage of these polar orbiters is nice, close imagery. You can mm -hmm. see a lot of detail. The disadvantage, though, is that the satellite flies by, right. and then you have to wait a while to get the next image. And it, if geostationary weaknesses are that you're reading the page like that, mm -hmm. the polar orbiter, you're reading the page straight on, but it's, it's so close. <laughs> and then right. it zips by, okay. and you have to wait for the satellite to come around the Earth again. So there's no one perfect solution. Okay. Different satellites for different orbits. Uh, each has their strength. And amazingly, it all comes back to Johannes Kepler and his laws of planetary motion, the same laws that govern how the planets orbit the sun, they govern how the satellites orbit the Earth, and even our little pretend salt shaker right, right here. Right, okay. Well, since, uh, what, the 1957 Sputnik, we've been uh, putting man-made objects into uh, orbit around the Earth and starting to get pictures back. Who knows what mm -hmm. will happen in the next 50 to 100 years. Amazing oh, it's, it's stuff. It's a growing science, and uh, the future is bright. Thank you so much for joining us again, Eric. And uh, for more information on GINA, and uh, what the satellite uh, systems do there and uh, what Eric's been talking about today, you can go to the web address on your screen. For Alaska Weather Facts, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back. Uh, today's sea ice analysis uh, <clears throat> looks a lot like yesterday. Still this strip of heavier ice north of the Bering Strait there and uh, expanding, slowly expanding area of uh, open water here off the western Arctic coast all the way down to the Bering Strait and Bering Sea ice essentially gone except for some a little bit of stuff here along the Yukon Delta coast and maybe the south coast, uh, Koyuk Bay there. Otherwise, uh, even in toward uh, Kotzebue Sound melting off in towards Kotzebue Sound and then some open areas showing up here on the far eastern coast or the Mackenzie River Bay area. South winds 40 knots tomorrow for northern Lincoln Island Glacier Bay areas. South 25 gusts 40 for Stevens Passage. Pretty good winds there as well. Northwest 25 for Clarence Strait, but only 15 knots down on the south coast. And then those winds increase 25 to 30 knots up on the north coast with 11 to 13 foot seas. For Tuesday, winds come down to 20 knots with four foot seas for northern Lincoln Canal. <clears throat> northwest 15 now for Stevens Passage, holding on to the 25 knot northwesterlies there for Clarence Strait. North winds at 20 knots on the south coast, seas subsiding to 5 feet. West winds 10 to 15, pretty nice up there on the north coast with 5 to 6 foot seas. And for uh, Cook Inlet, southwest 25 knots, north of the Forelands 20 knots, west 25, 8 foot seas for Kamishak Bay and that also across the Barren Islands and all the North Gulf Coast, west 25 knots, small craft advisories with those uh, seas running eight to nine feet. Then for Tuesday, light southeast winds, Prince William Sound, uh, light south winds for the eastern North Gulf Coast, back to the west, southwest at 10, seas five feet, Barren Islands, south 15, and south 10 knots, Kamishak Bay, Cook Inlet, south winds at 15 knots. Bristol Bay, all the way down to Cape Sarachev, west winds 15 knots with three to four foot seas, even lighter on the Pacific side here, uh, 10 to 15 knots right up to Sitkanak, eastern Kodiak, west 20, small craft advisories though for Shilakoff Strait, 25 knot winds. And then those become light southwest breeze on Tuesday, 10, maybe 15 knots, southeast 15, east side of Kodiak, east 15, Sitkanak, Castle Cape, then they turn northeast on down to Cape Sarachev, really light winds, Northwest uh, for the Bering Sea side of the peninsula, southwest at 10 here for Bristol Bay. And out over the western Aleutians, northwest, northeast at 20 knots with eight foot seas. So still small craft advisories with those sea heights. And east 20 knots, uh, Bering Sea side of the islands, central Aleutians on the south side, Pacific side, northeast 25 with eight foot seas. But uh, Fox Island just northeast at 10 with three to four foot seas. 
And it'll say uh, pretty light uh, for the Tuesday outlook, 10 to 15 knots from the north-northwest here for the eastern Aleutians. Central Aleutians pretty light, north 10 to 15. Seas uh, 3 to 6 feet and 15 knot winds all the way out to Shimia with 4 to 5 foot seas. And for the uh, Bering Sea, south of Nunavik Island, west breeze at 15, northwest 15. The Perbloffs, west 20, St. Matthew Island, northwest 15 for St. Lawrence Island and light westerlies for Norton Sound. Now on Tuesday, 10 knots out of the west up there for the Sound, northwest 10 from St. Lawrence Island all the way down along the southwest coast, more westerly along the coast there, north 15 for St. Matthew Island, light winds for the Perbloffs. And east winds 15 knots, central coast to demarcation point, west side west, east at 10, turning northeast from Cape Beaufort to Cape Thompson, and then from there south back around to the east at 10. Those become northwest at 10 here for the Chuck CC on Tuesday. East 10 for the uh, extreme west side here up to Cape Beaufort. And then those pick up to 15 knots. Looks like the remainder of the coastline will see 15 knot winds from the east. And for tonight, uh, rain will later tonight change to showers as that low weakens into a trough, tracks northward here, merges with the one already in the interior. So rain, Copper River Basin shifting up into the eastern part of the state from the Alaska Ranges all the way up to Eagle and uh, rain northern Panhandle isolated showers down to the south uh, with more clouds and cooler temperatures coming in trough out here keeps it unsettled cloudy and damp in the west all the way up to the northwest coast isolated rain or snow showers in the Arctic coast next system slipping southeastward out of the picture tomorrow high pressure taking over a couple of weak troughs here keep showers going along the southwest coast and to a lesser extent up over the northwest but uh, rain, eastern and mid Tanana Valley, or upper and mid Tanana Valley, less rain for the North Gulf Coast, isolated showers in the Panhandle. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1 800 WX Brief for a formal pre flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. <laughs>